Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we are now here for the second section of the Inspire School. And I'm very proud to introduce you the, the new speaker that is uh, Michael Dozer from, from CERN. Uh, Mike uh, started his career as me, more or less, <laughs> at CERN uh, some years ago, working at the, the LEAR, the Antiproton Low Energy uh, Ring. Um, from then on, uh, he, he keeps on uh, working in the field of, uh, of uh, antimatter. And right now, he is the spokesperson of the AGES uh, uh, experiment. And uh, today, uh, Mike will, uh, will present uh, a talk with uh, a very uh, uh, thrilling uh, title. It seems to me a sort of, uh, of thriller story. In fact, the, the title of his, uh, of his uh, presentation uh, is about uh, the, the case of, of the missing uh, antimatter. So, uh, Mike, please, uh, uh, the stage is yours and tell us something about this, uh, this subject. So, thank you for the opportunity. I'm very happy to be able to tell you about um, antimatter, talk about antimatter. And I'll be talking about the case of the missing antimatter because this is really like a criminal investigation. Uh, before I talk about the criminal investigation, though, I'd like to take a small detour uh, via Hollywood, uh, because, of course, anything interesting has already been looked at by Hollywood. And so there's a movie that was made uh, several years ago called Angels and Demons. I'd like to show you a small excerpt of the movie to give you a feeling for how exciting antimatter can be. Articles in transition. Conditions are fixed and running. LHC injecting protons, beam one. Lock the feedback systems. Particles at 99% the speed of light. Lighting stable beams. Inact injection kicker. We have a signal on the luminosity monitors. We have events. Photons are moving. So for those of you who understand Italian, uh, what was just said is we have antimatter, and this is the premise of the movie. Uh, antimatter is stolen in large amounts from the high energy particle accelerator, the LHC, as you just heard here, and is brought in traps, and you saw these traps at the end, to be hidden in the Vatican to form a highly explosive bomb. And of course, like any good thriller, there's a countdown until the destruction of the Vatican starts, and you have a race that is against the clock to try to save the Vatican. Of course, this is what the fiction shows. This is a picture of the antimatter trap, and what you see glowing in the center is supposedly antimatter. Now, this is partly true. Like any good fiction, it rests on reality. Antimatter exists, and I'll tell you a lot more about it. We produce it at CERN, although it's not really at the LHC that we produce most of it. It's actually more a dedicated factory that we use to produce it. A few grams of it would definitely be enough to destroy Rome. And I will tell you now what it is and why it is so interesting. If you go back to the old equation, E is equal to mc squared, which basically just says that energy and matter are the same thing, it means that if you can condense energy, for example, the kinetic energy of particles, of a proton and the nucleus, in a collision, you can use this condensed energy to form new particles, but not only new particles, also new antiparticles. Every time a particle is produced, it is accompanied by its antiparticles. Particles and antiparticles are always produced pairwise. And this is down to uh, the fact that conservation laws force them 
to have identical properties and always to have conservation of, for example, charge. So if I condense a energy at, in just the right amount, I can produce an electron, but it will always be accompanied by an antiatomic atom. Here in this picture, you can see to the left an anti-electron electron pair being produced from a photon that is produced in the first collision of something that you cannot see with something that you cannot see, but that then produces another pair of electron anti-electron. And on the right-hand side, you see lots of these pairs of particles and antiparticles, electrons and anti-electrons being produced. Matter and antimatter are always produced in pairs. And in fact, they're not just produced in pairs, but they're also destroyed in pairs. If you put an electron and an anti-electron together, they can retransform back into energy. And this energy can then retransform back into something else, matter and antimatter, or other forms of uh, structure. And if you go back to the Big Bang, at the moment of the Big Bang, where enormous amounts of energy were transformed into matter, you would expect that matter and antimatter particles, are, as they're produced in pairs, are produced in equal amounts, so that you end up, right after the Big Bang, a universe, with a universe that is 50% matter and 50% antimatter. So equal amounts of matter and antimatter. In order to look at this, you'd like to go back in time. You'd like to be able to see what is actually happening there. And the way you can do that is by looking out in space. So if you look at a, at a telescope right now, that looks out into space, you see galaxies, and the further away these galaxies are, the longer ago the light left from these galaxies to come to us. It takes light a lot of time to make it to us. And so if you look into the distance, you actually are looking into the past. And if you look into the past, you'll see that initially you see galaxies, then you see proto-galaxies, the first formation of galaxies, the first star is forming, about 400 million years after the Big Bang. Then you see an area where there's nothing, where there is no formation of stars, where there's no light being produced, the Dark Ages, which is the time it took the matter and possibly antimatter that was produced in the Big Bang to start clumping together to form stars. And then you see a wall, a wall corresponding to the moment in time, about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, when the temperature of the universe finally got to a low enough level that electrons and protons could stick together. Before that, they were too energetic and they wouldn't stick together. But after that moment, they do stick together. And it's that, at that moment that the universe becomes transparent. Before then, any light, any photon that was flying around could scatter off electrons, could scatter off protons. And so you would not be able to see anything. There's a wall of light at that point that you can still see right now in the microwaves. And so the telescope that's drawn on the right-hand side is the uh, Wilkinson um, telescope to look at the cosmic microwave background radiation. And if you look carefully at that picture, you'll see that there are different colors. These colors correspond to tiny variations of temperature that are actually the seeds of the galaxies later on. But the important point here is that you cannot see anything that happened earlier than 380,000 years ago. And so if you want to actually see what happened at the moment of the Big Bang, well, it's not with telescopes that you can see it. You have to do something else. The question now, if you look out there, is can you see the antimatter? It should be everywhere. 50% of the universe should be antimatter. And so Look at these galaxies, take a picture of the galaxies that you can see, not all the way back to the Big Bang, but at least those that you can see, and think that 50% of these should be made of antimatter. And also when you look at the cosmic microwave background, 50% of what you see there must be caused by the presence of antimatter. And the question is, how can you detect the antimatter that should have been there uh, in these pictures? In other words, how do you recognize antimatter? I, I said that particles and antiparticles must have the same properties. And this is down to fundamental symmetries, quantum field theory, 
the so-called CPT symmetry. This is charge, mirror, and time invariance. And that means that because the particles are the same, any atoms made up of these particles must also be the same. So if I take a proton and an electron and I put it together, I get an atom of hydrogen. If I take an antiproton and an anti-electron, I put those together, then I should get an atom of anti-hydrogen. And because the protons and the antiprotons and the positrons, the anti-electrons and the electrons have the same properties, that means that hydrogen and anti-hydrogen must have the same properties. And if they have the same properties, that means that light emitted by stars and by anti-stars is the same. They shine exactly the same way because the hydrogen and the anti-hydrogen atoms will emit light and absorb light exactly the same way. So it's impossible by taking a picture of objects in space to see whether they're made of matter or antimatter, with one exception. And the only exception is that if you can actually get matter and antimatter to meet each other because when they meet they can annihilate an electron can annihilate with an anti-electron transform into energy and then this energy can transform back into an electron and an anti-electron or it can transform into two photons into two pieces of light and these pieces of light must have as energy the mass of the electron because e is equal to mc squared the mass of the electron and the mass of the anti-electron are added together and then divided again into two, each photon carrying away exactly the same amount of energy. And this energy corresponds to 511 keV. That's just another unit of weight or of energy. And in fact, because this is light, it's just another color. This color is in the extreme ultraviolet. It's in the X-ray region, but you can look at galaxies you can look at our galaxy, for example. This is what you see here, the Milky Way. And we're looking at the center of the Milky Way. And you can try to filter out only this particular color and see if you see any production of that. In fact, the picture that you see here is not just of our Milky Way, but of the whole sky. And if there are other galaxies and anti-galaxies that are colliding with each other and annihilating, they also should be lighting up. So this way of looking at our own galaxy or looking at the sky at this particular color will show up any antimatter that is annihilating with matter. And what you actually see is that there is antimatter at the center of our galaxy that is annihilating with matter. This is shown by an, uh, uh, an observatory, a space telescope uh, called Integral, that showed that at the center of our galaxy there is antimatter annihilating with matter. But this antimatter that we can see there is a tiny amount. It's only the equivalent of three solar masses over the age of the universe. Whereas if half of our galaxy were antimatter, you would expect 50 billion stars rather than three. The second way you can look for antimatter is not by light, but actually by putting devices out above the atmosphere, because the atmosphere will, being made of matter, eliminate any antimatter that comes from outer space. If you're above the atmosphere, you can start looking for antimatter in cosmic rays, cosmic rays that come from all directions. And you can look at every single cosmic ray that goes through this little detector that you can see there uh, on the left hand side flying on board the International Space Station. This AMS detector is measuring the composition of every single particle that goes through it. Is this a proton? Is this an electron? Is this an antiproton? And so on. And so these are the two only tools that we have to look for antimatter out there. And so what's the answer? Well, the answer is that the universe, as we can see it, consists only of matter. The left-hand picture is a picture of the universe where I've put another filter on it, and this is a filter that only looks at matter, only detects matter. On the right-hand side, I have the same filter that only lets through pictures of antimatter. And this is all that you see. You only see matter in the universe, no antimatter. This is the mystery of the antimatter. It's the case of the missing antimatter, because we know that the antimatter must have been formed at the beginning, the moment of the Big Bang, but it has disappeared. Equal amounts of matter and antimatter were formed 14 billion years ago at the moment of the Big Bang. We exist because there is no more antimatter. If there were antimatter in equal amounts of matter, we would annihilate, we would transform back into energy 
We could not be stable. And the question is, how and where did it disappear to? In other words, why does nature prefer matter over antimatter? There's another asymmetry that you may know about in nature. This is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, we're just two sides of the same thing. And because I have a great love for antimatter, which was eliminated by matter, for me, the antimatter is Dr. Jekyll. And Mr. Hyde is what is around us right now. This is all the matter. What I'm trying to show with this picture is that there is a symmetry between matter and antimatter, but the symmetry is not perfect. It's not identical. Antimatter and matter are not quite the same. This is one way to try to explain why the antimatter may have disappeared by postulating such a symmetry breaking, by postulating such a small symmetry difference between matter and antimatter. And if there is such a symmetry breaking, if the universe is not symmetric, but rather anti-symmetric, that there's a tiny bit more matter than matter formed at the moment of the Big Bang, what you end up with is, of course, only matter, after all the antimatter has been destroyed, and an anti-symmetric or an asymmetric universe, a maximally anti-symmetric universe, because there is no antimatter left at all. So let's go back again to the Big Bang, try to see how we can investigate this disappearance, this case, and how we can try to look at this case. And there are two ways to do this. One is a crime scene investigation, looking at the world as it is now through telescopes or in experiments. And the other one is to try to reenact the crime scene. And for that, we cannot use telescopes. We actually have to reenact, reform the conditions which took place at the moment of the Big Bang. And this is what we're doing here at CERN. I've already told you about the crime scene investigation, which looks out into the universe with telescopes or with detectors that are flying above the atmosphere. What we're trying to do here at CERN is to investigate antimatter under the conditions that were those at the moment of the Big Bang. So we're trying to make antimatter and then study it very carefully. What you see here is an aerial picture of the area around Geneva. Uh, on the right-hand side is the Geneva Airport, and in the back is Geneva Lake. And what you see as the big white circle is the Large Hadron Collider, which is the most known part of, of CERN, the European Research Center for Particle Physics. And where the arrow is pointing is a tiny little part of CERN, a very small accelerator that produces antimatter and then studies it. Where we study it, we're trying to investigate four suspects, and all of these have been accused of breaking symmetry. We don't know who's the culprit, but we're trying to find out who is behind the asymmetry between matter and antimatter. This can be in the area of neutrino physics, and there a complicated system called liptogenesis transforms an asymmetry among neutrinos into an asymmetry into baryons, protons, and the antiprotons. It could be a symmetry breaking that is not complete, something called CP violation, charge and parity violation, which has been seen already in very short-lived particles called mesons. It could be a very fundamental symmetry breaking called CPT violation. So this is a symmetry breaking that breaks every single symmetry that we know of that is fundamental. Or it could even be gravity. Gravity might also have a preference for matter over antimatter. The interesting thing is that all of these um, suspects are working at low energies. We don't need a Large Hadron Collider to investigate these suspects. We just need much smaller accelerators at CERN and precision devices with which we can then investigate matter and antimatter and see if we find the difference. So I'm not going to talk about the first two. But I am going to talk about the last two suspects, CPT violation and gravity. Uh, the first two have very many interesting aspects to them, but uh, they lie outside of what we can do currently uh, in, in, at CERN. These are being investigated in other areas. And so let me come back to symmetry breaking. 
and talk a little bit about what this actually means, what these symmetries are. One symmetry that we're familiar with is parity. Uh, a ball looked at in the mirror, if you drop it, will be described exactly the same way, whether you describe it here in the world or whether you describe it in the mirror. The rules of physics are the same, the laws of physics are the same. If I now take a top and I twist it, then in my world, it'll turn like this. In the mirror image, it'll turn like that. And also this, for normal matter, is completely symmetric and the laws of physics are the same. However, in the case of neutrinos, this is no longer the case. I can spin a neutrino in this world. In the image, in the mirror, I should expect the neutrino to spin the other way around, but in reality, it doesn't. It doesn't exist. It's not even there. In our world, only neutrinos that spin like this exist. The mirror shows nothing. There is no air image of the spinning neutrino in the other world. I have to combine this with a second symmetry called CP, uh, not only the parity symmetry, but also the charge symmetry, so that a neutrino spinning like this would show up in a special mirror as an anti-neutrino spinning the other way around. And also this symmetry, the CP symmetry, is broken by certain mesons, by the K, B, and D mesons. Now we know there has to be a difference, and the where the way one can look for this difference is to try to measure the intrinsic properties of particles and antiparticles. So really looking whether their charge, their mass, their lifetime are the same. And this is equivalent to a test of the complete symmetry, the CPT symmetry, charge, mirror, and time. Or one can try to investigate whether particles and antiparticles behave differently in external fields whether they couple differently to forces. And we can test the four forces, the strong interaction, the weak interaction, gravity, and the electromagnetic interaction to see if they differentiate between particles and antiparticles. So we're looking at microscopic differences between matter and antimatter by, for example, building systems made of an anti-electron and an anti-proton, or an electron and a proton. The electron and the proton forms hydrogen, and hydrogen has certain energy levels. This atom has certain energy levels, and these energy levels correspond to the properties, the mass, the charge, the interaction between the proton and the electron. And by measuring the color of light emitted by hydrogen or the color of light absorbed by hydrogen, I can test whether hydrogen, and doing the same for antihydrogen, are the same, whether the laws of physics are the same for those two systems, whether the properties of an electron and an anti-electron or a proton and anti-proton are the same, if I compare this spectrum to this spectrum, the spectrum of anti-hydrogen. And the question is, are they the same or not? And this is an experimental question that one has to test. The same goes for gravity. If I drop an apple on the Earth, it will fall. If I drop an anti-apple on the Earth, Will it fall the same way? And also this is an experimental question. Of course, there are a priori. You can have expectations for what you will see, but the real proof in the end is when you've done the measurement and the measurement tells you that yes, they are the same, or no, they are not the same. And it's only that that allows you then to in improve your theoretical understanding or improve your model of reality. So to do these experiments, testing the color of light emitted by hydrogen and antihydrogen, or the gravitational behavior of antimatter, we're going to go to the antimatter factory at CERN, the antiproton decelerator, where you can see right now half a dozen experiments that are fed. They receive their antiprotons from an accelerator, from the proton synchrotron, that shoots protons onto an iridium target and transforms the motional energy of the protons into proton-antiproton pairs. And any antiprotons that are produced are then guided into this antiproton decelerator ring, which you can see as the number of boxes around these experiments, where the antiprotons that are produced almost at the speed of light are slowed down to one-tenth the speed of light, and then passed on into this hexagon structure, where they're slowed down another factor of 100, so that at the end, come out with an energy 
that is just enough to allow them to fly through an aluminum foil that has half a micron thickness. So a half of a thousandth of a millimeter thickness of aluminum. Any thicker than that, and the antiprotons will stop in that foil and annihilate. So we have very, very slow antiprotons that are then trapped inside these experiments, the Aegis experiment, the Alpha experiment, the ATRAP, Asaksa, BASE, PUMA, GBAR experiment. All of these experiments try to trap the antiprotons and then do measurements with these antiprotons. These traps are complicated. You can't just go and buy a supply of antimatter, a box of antimatter, a can of antimatter. You have to build your own traps. You cannot rely on industry to do this for you. And the big problem is really that the antiprotons that we receive, even the slow ones, are still very, very fast. In fact, the antiprotons are produced at a temperature, an energy, a velocity, that corresponds to something like their rest mass. Uh, the rest mass of a proton, of an antiproton, is a, in this unit here, a billion electron volt, and the antiprotons are produced a little bit higher in energy than that. Inside the antiproton decelerator, they're slowed down to 100 MeV, then inside the Elena ring, they're slowed down to 100,000 electron volts. We catch them after we've slowed them down a little bit more to a few thousand electron volts, then we have them in our apparatus, and we interact them with electrons inside our apparatus, which allows us to cool them down to a thousandth of an electron volt. This is just what we need to be able to manipulate them. But in order to actually form the atoms of antihydrogen that we want to study, we have to cool them down even more. We have to manipulate them uh, down to energies that are somewhere in the region of a thousandth and a millionth of an electron volt. And if you want to test gravity, you have to go down even further than that. In terms of temperature, our antiprotons are at a few degrees above absolute zero, at around 10 to 20 degrees above absolute zero. Antihydrogen atoms are formed with a temperature of around one degree above absolute zero. In order to watch antihydrogen drop, it has to have a temperature of at most a thousandth of a degree above absolute zero. So we're going down by something like 18 orders of magnitude in temperature from the moment the antiprotons are produced and the moment we can actually do physics experiments, measurements on them. The first experiment to have measured the color of antihydrogen we call the alpha experiment. And this experiment not only traps antiprotons, but also traps anti-electrons, and then puts the two together, forms antihydrogen atoms at a temperature of a few degrees above absolute zero, and then in order to measure the light that these atoms emit, has to hang on to them, catch them in a way. Now, it's easy to catch a charged particle because you can use electric fields and magnetic fields. But it's much, much harder to trap a neutral atom. A neutral atom has nothing you can hang on to except for the fact that the antihydrogen atom, just like the hydrogen atom, has an electron or an anti-electron. And this electron or the anti-electron has a small small magnetic moment. It's like a little bar magnet. And you can try to hang on to this bar magnet in a magnetic field that is not constant. That's good for charged particles, but in a magnetic field that grows in all directions. So the figure at the bottom left, the picture at the bottom left, shows you the red and green bars through which current circulates that forms a magnetic field that is not constant, but that has a min minimum at the center of this structure, at the center of the yellow rings with which one can manipulate antiprotons and antielectrons. And from that minimum out to the rings, the field, the magnetic field, grows from almost zero to almost one Tesla, a very strong magnetic field. And in that field, this is more or less the strongest magnetic field that you can build on such a small scale, you can hang on to atoms that have a temperature of at most a hundredth of a sorry, a tenth of a degree above absolute zero, 100 millikelvin. Anything hotter than that will run up this hill, this against the force of the magnetic field, touch the electrodes, these yellow rings, and annihilate them. But they have managed to make atoms that are cold enough. They've managed to trap them in there. And then once these atoms are in there, 
They're just sloshing back and forth like marbles in a bathtub, a very small bathtub. And now you can try to shine light on these atoms. And if the color of the light that you shine on the atoms corresponds to one of the colors of the hydrogen absorption spectrum, or the hydrogen emission spectrum, which is the same in this case, then that atom can absorb the light and be transformed in such a way that it can escape from the trap, touch the wall, and annihilate. And if you do this by you do this experiment by scanning the color of the laser light that you shine on these antihydrogen atoms that are trapped, by changing the, the tune, by detuning these lasers from the extreme ultraviolet across the extreme ultraviolet, then you can try to see when these atoms start absorbing the light, when they absorb lots of it, and when they stop absorbing it. And this is a way to measure those emission lines or absorption lines. And the more precise your laser is, the more precisely you can measure the color. And this has been done by the Alpha Collaboration uh, in the last few years, and they found that hydrogen and antihydrogen emit and absorb the same color of light to one part in 10 to the 12. It's an incredibly precise measurement, and they haven't seen a difference between matter and antimatter yet. There's no prediction for whether they will ever see a difference, because according to this fundamental symmetry of CPT, there should be no difference whatsoever. Of course, if there were no difference between matter and antimatter, then the universe would contain 50% of antimatter. So we know that's not the case, but we don't know if that's the right explanation. And if it's not CPT that is broken, perhaps it is something else. Maybe it's gravity that plays havoc with antimatter. And so we're trying, we can also try to measure the effect on antimatter. And in order to drop something, you have to hold on to it first. And so you can do this experiment either with ultra cold trapped antihydrogen atoms. And here you need temperatures of about a millionth of a degree above absolute zero, micro Kelvin temperatures. Or you can try to shoot antihydrogen atoms, like the gentleman on the right hand side is doing, and to watch their parabolic trajectory, or rather measure the endpoint of the parabolic trajectory. So these are the two attempts that are being made right now. Uh, in the case of the pulsed beam, you only need cold atoms. About one Kelvin, one degree above, above absolute zero, is enough to do the trick. So this is what the canon for antihydrogen atoms looks like. Simple idea, you make cannonballs, you shoot them, and you detect them. So what you see here on the right-hand side is our cannon, our miniature cannon, inside which antihydrogen atoms are made, pulse-produced and accelerated to fly out on the right-hand side. And then all we need to do, it's a big all, is to see where they fall. So if they do not feel gravity at all, they will fly on a straight line all the way to a detector. And on this detector, because the detector is made of matter, they will annihilate and we will see them. And so you can sort of create bands of where you expect the anti-hydrogen atoms to land. These bands are made by an interferometer that I haven't drawn here, but this interferometer results in anti-hydrogen atoms falling in certain regions or ending up in certain regions if they are not susceptible to gravity. If I now turn on gravity, then the antihydrogen atoms will drop a little bit by about 10 microns, so a hundredth of a millimeter. And when they touch the detector, they annihilate, and this is something we can then detect. Of course, a single antihydrogen atom is not enough to measure this. You need many, many antihydrogen atoms. And then you ask yourself where they end up, where all of them end up. You see every single one of these stars is one point where an antihydrogen atom ends up. And from that, you can extract the parabolic trajectory and extract the strength of gravity. Now our detector needs to be very sensitive, very precise, because it has to see a drop of 10 micron. And so you'd actually like to be able to see this to a precision of one micron. And one way to do that is to use a very old technology, photographic plates, which was first used in 1933 to investigate cosmic rays. This was a, a physicist called Marietta Blau who invented this technique and was also first used to show that antiprotons actually exist. This is the first photograph of an antiproton 
being produced, slowing down in photographic emulsion, stopping, and then at the point where it stops, it annihilates, and the annihilation products come out as a starburst in all directions. And with this, you can show that antiprotons not only exist, but also annihilate, that they are different from other particles. Our pictures are better. Uh, we, we've had a bit of time to improve the photographic plates. So this is an antiproton annihilation in a photographic plate of our experiment. And in this picture, you can see five or six annihilations resulting in these starbursts. And of course, depending on the annihilation process itself, we may end up with many fragments. Maybe this was an antiproton annihilating on a nitrogen or an oxygen nucleus, or only a fragment or two. And this is maybe an antiproton annihilating on a hydrogen atom or hydrogen nucleus. Now, what we want to do is look at these annihilations very precisely. And so we need to scan our photographic emulsion very precisely. Each one of the dots that you see in this picture is a slight darkening of our photographic emulsion and has a diameter of a tenth of a micron. And so you can see from this scan that we're able to reconstruct the point at where the anti-hydrogen atom annihilates, or where the anti-proton with the anti-hydrogen atom annihilates, to about one micron, which is exactly the precision that we want to achieve. And we can do this not only in one direction, in, in depth, but we can also do this in a three-dimensional scan, where we then reconstruct in three dimensions the annihilation point of the antiproton inside the photographic so this is a great way to show where antiprotons annihilate and how they fall. But of course, not everybody is as interested in fundamental physics as we are. And so we're regularly asked to come up with ways of using antimatter that is actually relevant for humanity. And so we scratched our heads, obviously, and we tried to come up with a number of ideas where antimatter could play a role and came up with four ideas, basically. Uh, the first one having to do with positron emission tomography, head scans, in order to look inside the body. The second having to do with radiotherapy. The third one having to do with energy production. And the fourth one having to do with, well, how do we make money? Because research is expensive, so if we can figure out how to get money out of this, then we can fund our research. So let me start with positron emission tomography which really is based on detectors. You can see here a patient being placed inside a detector. Uh, these detectors were originally developed in physics labs, but they're used for medical imaging, and they're sensitive to any processes that accumulate molecules. The trick here is to use molecules that have been fabricated with radioisotopes that emit positron, anti-electron. And if such an anti-electron is produced, it will annihilate, and you can reconstruct this annihilation point with a PET scanner. And that then allows you, for example, to create scans of the brain or of the body. The way this works is you take a molecule, for example, sugar, um, or rather glucose, uh, you replace in a specific type of glucose, this FDG type of glucose, one of the fluorine atoms by a radio isotope of fluorine. And this can be fluorine, but it can also be carbon, it can be nitrogen, it can be oxygen. Any positron-emitting isotope can be used. All you need to do is incorporate it in the molecule that has a physiological function. Because you want this molecule to be absorbed by cells that are doing something. And you want to see where those cells that are doing something are located inside the body. Now, this sugar, this glucose, this labeled glucose can then be injected into the patients. The body will distribute it across the whole body, and the molecule will end up in a specific area where the physiological function that you're interested in happens. So this can, for example, be metabolism, just metabolic rate. This is why the sugar is being used. Basically, any cell that ticks needs energy, and sugar is a way to bring in energy. Now, most cells just are running on a relatively low uh, diet, low low-carb diet, but some cells need a lot of energy, and those are typically cells that have to do with cell growth, and I'll come back to that in a second. Once the molecule is in those, the radioactive fluorine 
can decay. It doesn't have to decay. Maybe this molecule gets transformed and a fragment of the molecule gets eliminated again. But certainly in those cells, you'll have an accumulation of radioisotopes, which then produce, in the moment the anti-electron is produced by the decay of the radioisotope, it will annihilate with an electron proton. Exactly the same two photons that I talked about before when I was talking about cosmological searches for dark matter. These photons, because the glucose, the fluorine, the positron are all more or less at rest, will be emitted back to back. And as they are emitted back to back, they have a straight line. And when the straight line intersects a detector crystal, it can be detected. And so you end up with two crystals those two red flashes, two red stars in the matrix of crystals that surround the patient, seeing something. And then if you require a coincidence between the two signals, you know that somewhere along that line was a cell that had accumulated a radioisotope. This allows you then to reconstruct photons. There's many, many... Distribute those I'm sorry to say that Michael is having some problems with the, the network connection. Uh, therefore, we have to, to wait for a while that he would be able to, to reconnect. Uh, in the meanwhile, if the, the audience uh, has uh, some questions, you can write on the chat your question and I will uh, um, then report uh, to our speaker your, uh, your questions, your doubts. Don't be shy, you can ask anything uh, regarding the uh, antimatter and the presentation that uh, Mike Dozer was, uh, was presenting. I hope it will, will not take too long to reconnect. Any questions? I don't see anybody writing on the chat. You don't have any curiosity about antimatter? These are the usual troubles with the video conferences. Unfortunately, uh, when there are network problems, uh, this could happen. So, uh, I see that there is a question. There are questions coming out. Did antimatter ever, ever hurt anyone? Oh, no, no, no. I can tell you that, for instance, heaven, even here in Frascati, we produce antimatter. We produce uh, uh, positrons, the anti-electrons uh, that uh, Michael was speaking about. And uh, the point is that as soon as antimatter get in contact with uh, with matter it annihilate we said uh, so it is immediately destroyed 
and uh, this um, reaction uh, follow the, the famous law that Michael was showing, uh, energy equal to mass. So when an electron and, uh, and the positron fuse annihilate, what we see is a bubble of energy that then convert in other form of, of matters. But actually, uh, this is not something uh, uh, dangerous because uh, it happens uh, instantaneously and uh, there is uh, something that actually if the quantity of antimatter we could have uh, is big enough uh, maybe we can annihilate uh, and and then destroy a big fraction of matter but this is not the case uh, the antimatter that uh, we we or CERN is producing is in, in, in small, in small uh, quantity. What we can do with antimatter? Uh, ah, I'm back. You are back. Okay, I was trying to answering some questions, waiting for you. But uh, okay, so, you will do later on, probably better than me. So, Mike, if you can uh, put back your uh, presentation. There we go. And now I'm going to see if it works. We'll see how how far. Uh, how things are going. Okay, so uh, I talked about this. I'd like to go right away to the next picture, which is now a reconstructed image of, of via positron emission tomography of a person, uh, where you can see really the, the the distribution of cells inside the body. All the cells are emitting a little bit of light, so you can see the body in three dimensions as it's a reconstructed image. At the top, you can see the brain, which is a huge consumer of energy always. At the bottom, uh, in the middle, you can see the heart and the kidney, where there's a lot of blood, of course, that is going through all the time. And so if you have injected radioisotope uh, labeled molecules, they're certainly going to be visible in there. And then you can see the bladder. Obviously, um, some of the radioisotopes, some of the molecules and some of the molecular fragments are going to be eliminated and so you're going to be able to see those uh, in form of the bladder. But what you also see here in the middle is some points that should not be emitting light. And those are unfortunately metastases of uh, cancer forms inside the liver. And so this is a way to detect cancer inside a patient without actually um, invasively going into the patient. And you can only see this because it's a, um, a, um, a method that allows you to see the metabolically active areas of the body. If you look at x-rays, you may not be able to differentiate between the cells that are cancerous and the cells that are not cancerous. You actually have to look at their activity, that the cancer cells are growing very rapidly and thus have a high need of sugar, of energy. But you can also study other areas of the body and you can even try to understand certain areas of the body uh, anything that has to do with metabolism, with neurotransmitters, or uh, with uh, physiological modifications, for example, Alzheimer, can also be seen as long as you have molecules that bind to that particular area of uh, the body or of the brain. So serotonin receptors, dopamine receptors, amyloid binding molecules, opioid receptors, uh, all these can be used for pharmacological investigations, but also for investigations that go a little bit more deep into a sociological side of things. For example, on the top right, uh, there is a scan of a brain of a man and a brain of a woman. Uh, serotonin has uh, has been identified in this case. Mike, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, because I think the slides are not proceeding. We are still on the slide where you introduced the, the, the pet. Uh, okay, oh. now, okay. You now see we are Yes, but we haven't seen the previous one with the, the body pet, the full oh. body. Yeah. Oh, that's embarrassing. Um, yeah. You should be seeing, do you see the, the body pet now? Yes, it, it's uh, still, it's not moving. You are not in full screen. I'm in full screen here. Very strange. We are seeing the other uh, monitor, not the, the correct one. So stop share. I'm going to share again, uh, share screen.
entire screen. Now I have it. Allow. Yes. Very, very sorry. I'm not used to this um, StreamYard uh, way of doing things. So Perfect. now you're watching the movie, and you yes. see what I was talking about before. Uh, I, I won't repeat all of it. It's just that you can see both the body through the, the blue outline. These are just cells that have a little bit of, um, of glucose. You can see the bladder at the bottom, the brain at the top, the heart and the kidney, which are very full of um, molecule-saturated blood. And you see the metastases inside the, the body in the center, areas that should not be lit up. And I was also pointing out that you can look at other parts of the body. And the picture I want to outline in particular is the top right-hand side, where now instead of using uh, um, glucose, a serotonin receptor, a serotonin uh, uptake molecule was, uh, or, or radioactively labeled serotonin was injected so that you can see where the serotonin receptors in the brain are. And serotonin has to do with um, happiness. And if you look at the picture of the man and the woman, you can see that their serotonin uh, sensors, their receptors are identical. Men and women can be equally happy and they will be happy in the same ways. This is what that picture shows. So let me come to the next step, which is really then trying to combine different ways of looking inside the body. On the left-hand side, you can look at structure via uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, which is very, very sensitive to the distribution of water or of uh, certain um, types of atoms inside the body. On the right-hand side, so the, the, the one on the left shows you structure with very high resolution, better than a millimeter. On the right-hand side, you can look with positron emission tomography at activity. Where are things happening inside the body? And if you combine the two, this is the center image, you can really see which structures inside the brain are particularly relevant for specific physiological activities or uh, physiological states. So a combined view of things is much, much richer than the individual views themselves. Now, assuming you've discovered a tumor via positron emission tomography, you then want to treat it. And one way to treat it is radiation therapy, which has traditionally been using x-rays. X-rays penetrate the body, but unfortunately, they um, do not have a certain range inside the body they actually have a probability of stopping, which means that if you look at the picture on the left, the x-rays coming from the top left will tend to stop in the first few centimeters of the body. And as you go deeper inside the body, there will be less and less x-rays that will be able to reach that point where you actually want them to stop. Let's assume you want to irradiate the central part, uh, that area that is a bit in green on the left-hand side, in the left picture. You'll see that with x-rays, there's no way of irradiating that part without doing a lot of damage to the healthy tissue upstream of that green area, and even doing quite some considerable damage on the bottom right-hand side, in the, the overall yellow-greenish area, which is still going to be irradiated uh, because a certain number of the x-rays are going to make it to there. This is why a long time ago, uh, 20, 30 years ago, people decided to replace x-rays by protons. Protons have a very nice behavior, which is that if you shoot them into an object, they have a certain depth at which they stop. Depending on the energy that they have, they will go more or less deeply. And if you tune the energy very finely, you can define this stopping point to about a millimeter. So with protons, you can save the healthy tissue upstream of the area that you want to irradiate. You also save the healthy tissue downstream of the area that you want to irradiate, and you can concentrate the damage that you want to do to only that area that you actually want to harm and uh, where you want to destroy the tumorous cells. So protons are a great thing. Uh, they're somewhat more expensive than x-rays, which is why x-rays still continue to be used in certain cases. But we were wondering whether it would be possible to do even better than with protons by using antiprotons. So we built a small experiment. These are three colleagues of mine who uh, came up with the experiment uh, where we irradiated living hamster cells in an experiment called antiproton cell experiment, living hamster cells with antiprotons. And in order to see what was happening, we needed to be able to keep these hamster cells happy and alive and immobile. 
and in something that resembles a human body. And so the box that you see on the right-hand side, the aquarium, is what a physicist thinks a human being looks like. The cells are inside this white tube. They're inside gelatin so that they can't move around. And the water around it just mimics what our body is, which is mainly water. So any radiation that escapes from the cells will hit the water just like it would in a real, uh, in a real irradiation in a human being. And we can thus measure the effect also not just on the cell that was hit, but also on the neighboring cells. The antiprotons come out this bluish circle in the center. That's actually a window that separates the antiproton decelerator and its vacuum pipe from real life. And the energy that the antiprotons has allows them to fly about 10 centimeters deep into water, which is the center of this aquarium. And if you do this, what you find is that compared to protons, which is the red curve, and to photons, which is the blue curve, antiprotons are much more efficient. Uh, the pic curve here doesn't show this because you can choose two things. You can either ask yourself, if I'm willing to have the same amount of damage as with protons, how much more damage do I do in the tumor with antiprotons? And there the answer is, yes, it's a factor. It's better. It's, it's fa uh, better by a factor of four. So this is a very good way of treating uh, tumor cells. Or you can try to represent this as saying, well, I would like to do the same amount of damage as with protons. Do I gain with respect to protons? And there the answer again is yes. Uh, I gain because I do less damage to the cells upstream. I do less damage to the cells upstream and the distribution itself is very narrow. So proton therapy is good. Anti-proton therapy is even better. You can see the, the quality of the green curve compared to the red curve. It's narrower, so less damage to the healthy cells. Or if I scale it up accordingly, it does more damage per antiproton coming in, um, so I destroy more cells in the tumor. Now, this is a great idea, but of course, there, there are competitors. The yellow curve is what you get when you shoot carbon ions, so the nuclei of carbon into a cell. And you can see that they're sort of intermediate between the antiprotons and the protons. They're narrow. They do a bit less damage upstream in the healthy cells. They do a bit more damage downstream. Um, but the important thing is they're a lot cheaper. This experiment showed that you can use antiprotons to do this, to irradiate tumor cells with antiprotons, but first of all, these were healthy hamster cells in a test tube and not human tumor cells in a human body. Second of all, it's much too expensive. And third of all, ions can do almost as well for a fraction of the cost. So this is something that's still being studied, but it's not likely to be um, going to be used anytime soon. So of course, another question that you can ask yourself is whether antimatter would be useful as fuel. Uh, in fact, it's not so much as fuel that one can use it. It's not a good energy source, but it's a good battery because it is the maximal effic maximally efficient battery that you can think of relative to the weight of the fuel. So Compared to nuclear reactions, it's about a thousand times more efficient. Compared to uh, chemical reactions, it's about a million times more efficient. And in fact, it's not so difficult to produce antimatter. Every living being produces antimatter. You in your bodies are producing about 100 to 200 positrons, anti-electrons per hour. Uh, this simply comes from the fact that in your body you have radioactive potassium-40. This is a natural isotope that you just absorb from the environment when you drink water, when you eat, when you breathe. And as a good rule of thumb, you can remember one banana produces one positrons per hour. Now, unfortunately, um, this isn't a lot of antimatter. In order to actually build a, a fuel for a spaceship, you need quite a lot of antimatter. Uh, the annihilation of antimatter with matter produces a lot of energy. And if I had something like one gram or a quarter of a gram of matter and a quarter of a gram of antimatter, and here I'm going back to the movie at the beginning where this is about the amount of antimatter that was extracted, 
I'd end up with something that's equivalent to about 10 kilotons of TNT, which is a lot. So with one quarter of a gram of antimatter, you can get a lot of bang. The problem is that you need to make that amount of antimatter. And if you look at what CERN can produce, it's about 10 to the 7, so 10 million antiprotons per second, or something like 10 to the 14 antiprotons per year, which sounds like a big number until you compare it with Avogadro's number, which is about 10 to the 24 particles, which means that you need, well, 10 to the 14 antiprotons per year, you need 10 to the 24 particles, so you need 10 to the 10 years, 10 billion years, to produce something of the order of about one gram which is a little bit a long time to wait. And furthermore, it's a little bit expensive. Uh, one can estimate how much it would cost just running CERN for that long uh, and, and just focusing on, on the cost of the anti-matter uh, facility at CERN. And you'd end up with a number of around 25 million billion euros to make one gram of antimatter. That's quite a lot of, uh, of euros, quite a lot of money. Uh, and in fact, if you look at this the other way around, you can ask yourself, how much energy does CERN produce through the annihilation of antimatter? We make about 10 nanograms per year. Well, that's about 250 watt hours. So enough for a cup of tea, but not much more than that. And in banana equivalents, you need about 10 to the 20 bananas to make something like that. Which tells you that antimatter is very very valuable. It's very expensive. Gold only costs about 50,000 euros per kilogram, but antimatter, and the cheapest source of antimatter is radioisotopes, so sodium-22, where you have to pay about 50,000 euros per gigabecquerel, which is a billion disintegrations per second. That's the strongest source you can get. Well, this corresponds to about 10 to the minus 10 grams that you can extract from a reasonable source. And that means that antimatter is about 10 to the 13 times more valuable than gold. It's the most precious subject, uh, uh, material that you can, you can think of. And if you have something that precious, obviously what you should do is think of basing, uh, founding a bank based on antimatter. And this has actually been done, although only in the form of an art project. Um, who has formed the first bank of antimatter, which is based on a certain quantity of radioisotope. And the nice thing about this, contrary to the gold standard, which is what banks used to be founded on, is that this radioisotope will di disappear over time. So in a certain way, the remaining radioisotope should become more and more and more precious. And so you should become more and more rich over time. And with that, I've come to the end of what I wanted to talk about. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Michael. And I start With reading it. some questions from the chat. And there is a, the first question was about uh, how dangerous is antimatter? Uh, did antimatter ever hurt uh, anyone? Um, so, sorry, I just. Uh, Ah, I just have to um, hang up here. There we go. Uh, antimatter has never harmed anybody that I know of. Uh, radiation certainly has. Uh, people have stood inside um, beams of particles, and they have been harmed by that. But antimatter, we have never managed to make enough antimatter that it has had any effect whatsoever on uh, humans. It's, it's very difficult to make antimatter in reasonable amounts, as I, I showed. And... In those amounts that we can make it, um, you could stand next to our anti annihilating antiprotons and it would have no effect on you at all. It's, uh, it's a very, very rare uh, substance. Another question is about how difficult and why is so difficult to trap the antimatter? Hmm. So it's difficult to, to trap, well, I should take a step back. It's been difficult to trap in the past because the antimatter that we've been able to make in the accelerators is moving too fast. And so you need to slow it down to be able to trap it. Remember, in, a, in an apparatus that you can work with under reasonable conditions, you can think of doing something like 100, sorry, 10,000 volts. That, that's already a pretty big electric field. And with 10,000 volts, 
you're only catching a minute fraction of the antiprotons. The antiprotons that are circulating inside the accelerator and that have been slowed down very, very carefully are still moving with an energy of a million volts. And so as they came out of the accelerator, we had to slow them down by colliding them with, with sheets of metal or foils of metal, a few micron, a few hundred micron of metal, to slow them down. And then we could only get a small fraction of those that we'd slowed down because sometimes you slow them down too much, sometimes not enough. So we only had an efficiency of 1%. Now with the new accelerator with Elena, things are very different. There, the accelerator will bring them down to 100,000 volts. So we only have to go from 100,000 to 10,000 volts. We have to slow them down. And again, we're going to do this with sheets, foils, uh, not of metal because metal is too thick. We need uh -huh. to use very, very thin foils of uh, plastic, uh, so-called perylene, which we can make in 100 nanometer thick foils. And there we need three or four of those foils to slow down the antiprotons. Now, because the antiprotons are so slow already at the beginning, we lose a lot less, and so we can catch almost all of them. The problem isn't catching them. The real problem is making them. We're not efficient at making antiprotons. There, uh, the production rate is limited by how many protons you can accelerate and how many of the antiprotons that come out you can then get. You can accelerate lots of protons, but then if you shoot them onto a target, their energy is going to be dumped into the target. So if you put too many protons into this target, you may get up out lots of antiprotons, but the target itself will melt. And so at that point, you only have one shot and that's it. You have to replace your target. You have to stay below this critical limit. And that means that you're never going to be able to make more than about 10 million, maybe 100 million per shot. And you have to wait a little bit between the shots so that the target can cool down again. Otherwise, again, you drill a hole and you're not going to get more. Let me tell you another question that is, uh, um, is there a theoretic way to produce more antimatter? Uh, the only the only way to make antimatter is to transform energy into stuff. And the only way we found up to now is by really, by simply smashing things together. That that's a, in a collider, in a fixed, in a target, um, radioactive decays will do the trick for you. So if you have lots of radioactive material, uh, like a lot of cesium or a lot of potassium, you can get lots of anti-electrons, but then you don't want to have such huge amounts of radioactive material around. And that only gets you anti-electrons because in nuclear reactions, so the transformation of a neutron into a proton or a proton into a neutron in this case, you are releasing a little bit of energy that's just enough to make an anti-electron, not much more than that. If you want to make an anti-proton, you need about 2,000 times more energy. And this 2,000 factor of 2,000 is impossible to get in nuclear decays in, in radioactive decays. So for antiprotons, there is no alternative to colliders that I know of. And then uh, concerning the asymmetry between matter and antimatter, there is a guy asking if how, how close we are to, to, to understand why the antimatter disappeared. It, it, the question is whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. <laughs> uh, we've, We've been, people have been looking for this asymmetry for the last 60, 70 years and haven't found it. Now, they've tried very hard. They've, a lot of measurements have been extremely precise and we haven't seen it in symmetry violations. We haven't seen it in uh, the behavior of specific short-lived particles. We're at this cusp now uh, from next year on probably of being able to test gravity with with antimatter. It might show up something, but probably it won't. It, probably if there's any difference, it will be tiny. And so we're going to probably have to wait, work, not wait, uh, hard for a decade, two decades, until we reach the sensitivity that we would need to actually be able to see a tiny difference between matter and antimatter with respect to gravity. There's another area where people are looking for a difference, and that's in the neutrinos. Uh, I didn't want to talk about that because this is an area that uh, has different uh, different time horizons, 
But also there, people are looking for neutrinos that oscillate into other types of neutrinos. Neutrinos can do this because they're neutral. And um, by looking at these oscillating neutrinos very carefully, you might be able to see whether a neutrino oscillates the same way as an antineutrino oscillates, changes identity. It just basically switches identity. And we know that neutrinos change this identity. This is something that has been seen. The question is whether antineutrinos do it exactly the same way. The switching of identity is being looked into by a number of experiments that are being built now in the United States and in Japan, and that will start running in about 10 years' time. So maybe they will see an effect. And the last question, let me ask you, is about uh, this um, more effectiveness of antiprotons uh, in, the, in the treatment of, uh, of tumors. You said that, that antiprotons annihilate with matter. So how can they penetrate inside a body? Very good question. Um, because it's, it's really completely counterintuitive that an antiproton that can annihilate with matter the moment it touches matter can actually enter matter. And the way to understand what's happening there is to think about what matter actually is. If you, if you hit matter, you think it's something solid, but actually this is all empty. Um, it's empty space. If you look at an atom, the, the mass of the nucleus is concentrated, the mass of the atom is in the nucleus. The nucleus is tiny compared to this huge cloud of electrons that is flying around it. An antiproton cannot annihilate with an electron. It actually has to annihilate with a proton or a neutron. And so the only way it can annihilate if it flies into a structure of atoms is if it is lucky or unlucky enough to hit a nucleus. But if it just flies by the nucleus, nothing will happen. It'll bounce off the electrons. And in fact, almost all antiprotons that enter an object bounce off the electrons. And in this bouncing off process, lose a bit of energy. They slow down. And in this slowing down at some point, they reach a point where they're so slow that instead of bouncing off the electron, they actually kick out the electron and replace the electron inside the atom. Now they're trapped inside the atom and they can cascade down by emitting X-rays. And then at some point, because they're so heavy, they're so close to the nucleus that they end up plowing through the protons and the neutrons. And that's when they annihilate. So by choosing the energy of the antiprotons just right, you can minimize the likelihood of them hitting a nucleus. That's about one in per mil, one in a thousand of the antiprotons is unlucky and hits the nucleus on the way in. But 99% or 99.9% .9 of the antiprotons will all stop more or less within a millimeter of each other and get captured, annihilate right there, cascade down and annihilate. So this is how the, the, how the antiprotons get through the, through the first step of, of, say, 10 centimeters. And I think this uh, explanation also uh, reply to another question that was uh, asking uh, why and how uh, by using uh, plastic foils you decelerate uh, the exactly. antiprotons. Exactly, it's the same thing. We're just bouncing the antiprotons off the electrons. Almost all of them uh, bounce off the electrons. I know there was one question that I saw when I opened this chat before, and that was what the difference between matter and dark matter. Did you answer that already? Uh, but I think it's, it's better if you give your answer. If you answer this, it's probably is the same answer. Is the, the, my answer is uh, antimatter is something we know. It's the same yes. thing as matter, except it's opposite. The charges are opposite. Whereas dark matter, we have no idea what it is. It can be very, very heavy things like black holes uh, that have hundreds of masses of the sun. It can be small black holes that are flying through space from the Big Bang and that haven't evaporated yet. It can be big, heavy particles that can be produced maybe in an accelerator like the LHC or maybe in a bigger accelerator because they are too heavy to be produced in the LHC. Or they can be very, very light particles, particles so light that you can't talk about a mass anymore. You have to talk about a size of the particle. You know that every particle has a wavelength and the heavier the particle, the shorter the wavelength is. Well, if you go the other way around, the lighter the particle is, the bigger the wavelength gets. The lightest particles that people are thinking about as candidates for dark matter are the size of a galaxy. The whole galaxy is just big enough to hold this very, very light dark matter candidate uh, called axion. And since we have no idea what they could be, there's no theory that predicts what they are, 
we have to look everywhere. We have to look at the very light masses, the heavier masses, the intermediate masses, at accelerators in space, looking for uh, big chunks, looking for very big chunks, with telescopes, with accelerators, with precision measurements, until we find one place where we see dark matter, we're basically looking for a needle, not in one haystack, but in billions of haystacks. And we don't know what the needle looks like either. To conclude, there is uh, somebody asking if you can suggest some um, literature, some bibliography where people can learn more about antimatter. So there's a book by Frank Close on antimatter uh, that is a good introduction. Uh, I don't know the title, but if you look for the author Frank Close, C-L-O-S-E, yes, I can write here. Then uh, you'll find a book by him, and that's in English, and so I think it would be reasonably uh, easy to to read for most people. What you should not do is go to Hollywood uh, <laughs> and to explain antimatter to you. Yes. Don't believe that angels and demons is, is real and the CERN look like uh, was show up in the in the movie. The only thing that's that's correct in that movie is the color and even that of the anti atoms that were trapped inside those traps, because you noticed if you paid attention that it's white or actually bluish, and uh, real anti hydrogen trapped anti hydrogen glows in the ultraviolet. So that's how you would see it. Thank you, Michael. I think it's time to close uh, this session. That was really interesting. So thanks again a lot for giving up this uh, lecture and I hope to see you soon. Absolutely. My pleasure.